Amen. Church, say amen again. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'm glad because of it. Amen. I'm glad to be in the house of God today. Uh, missing uh, my other half. Uh, she's taking care of the other half uh, who's not feeling well today. But we're thankful to God uh, for his goodness and his grace uh, shown towards all of us throughout this week. Um, many times we uh, take for granted the fact that God has allowed us to uh, get throughout another week. Uh, and God has been good to us, um, so good to us, far than we can ever be uh, to ourselves. And for that, I am thankful. Uh, before we begin our lesson today, let us uh, go to God in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for just being mindful of us who are unworthy to be loved by you, the God of heaven. But you see fit in your infinite wisdom to love us, to supply our every need, and most of all, to give your son, Jesus Christ, for our redemption, our sanctification, our justification, and our atonement. Father, we're so thankful for you, for Christ our Lord, and for the gift, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, which guides us into all truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we embark upon this lesson today about death, we pray that truly and honestly, Heavenly Father, we will make sure that our house is set in order. Father, we sing the song, I'm going that way, and the truth of the matter is we all are going that way. But the question is, will we be prepared when we meet that way? Help us now, guide us as we look into your inspired word. Give us wisdom, give us understanding, and Heavenly Father, help us to apply those things that we hear. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this prayer in faith and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. We all have attended our fair share of funerals. And I said this a few weeks ago, no matter how many funerals you attend, death is just something that you and I can never get used to. No matter how many times it's impacted us, death is just not something that comes natural to our human minds. It always has a way of, of stinging us and causing us just for a moment to have some clarity about what life is all about. A week ago, I decided that I'm not going to wait to the next funeral to preach about death. I think it's important that we, as God's children, understand death fully. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, in the verse 19, God said in talking to Adam after he had sinned. He said, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So just in those two verses right there, we see that this body, amen, this thing that we often see laid up up here in, in caskets, this thing is returning back to that 
which was, was, in which it was formed from. This body is returning to the dust that it was formed from. Amen. The spirit that you and I have is going back to who? Going back to God who gave it. Is that all right? Because you have to remember in the beginning when God took dust and he formed man, he breathed into man the breath of life. He breathed into man what God is. And God is what? God is spirit. And he breathed into man's spirit. And that combination of the spirit and that, that body that was formed from the dust created something else. It created what? A living soul. So while your spirit goes back to God who made it, while your flesh, your body goes to the ground from which it was formed, your soul has another destination. Is that all right? You see, we have to ask about what's really important, and that's about the soul. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Now watch this. He's talking about setting them apart holy. Now watch what he says. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who will also do it. You say, well, why are you speaking about all this? Why, what, what does this pertain to, to me? Why, why are we talking about this today? We're talking about this because, ready or not, death is coming. Not to someone else. It's coming for you. Is that all right? And sometimes we have a way of, in our minds, amen, and we talked about this on yesterday in our classes, some way we have a way in our minds of out of sight, out of mind. We think that it'll happen to everyone else. We, we wake up this morning and we see that some children were killed in Akron in a house fire. We think that that always happens to everybody else. But I'm here today to tell you, your time is coming too. And the thing is, you and I don't know when. Is that all right? So seeing how we don't know when we're going to take our last breath, are you, am I prepared? Isaiah chapter 38, if you go with me, please. Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 1. We want to take a brief lesson from Hezekiah and the lesson will be ours. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 1 if you have it say amen the word of God says in those days is that what your Bible says and in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death and Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos came unto him and said unto him thus saith the Lord set thine house in order for thou shalt die and not live. Now, what I don't want you and I to, to think is that this is just a word for Isaiah or a word for Hezekiah. Because the truth of the matter is, if you want to make it a broad application, God might as well be speaking to you and I to, today. Set your house in order for you shall die and not live. Is that all right? But I want to go back to the first part of this verse just to uh, uh, make a point. It says in those days, because sometimes we think that situations got to be a certain way in order for death to come. Understand that you don't have to be sick in, in order to die. Understand things ain't got to be going wrong in your life in order for someone to pass away. Is that all right? Has anyone experienced death just out of the blue? Just, just death just, just happens and you have no uh, awareness of it, no, no heads up about it. It just occurs. 
You see, death, amen, death doesn't have to give you and I a heads up that it's coming. And watch this. No matter if you're black or white, rich or poor, death does not discriminate. Isn't it funny? Or ironic, I should say. My brother and I was at University Hospital last week. And I, I said to myself, you know, what all that's going on in our world and society about uh, classism and racism and all these other things, sickness doesn't discriminate. When you go to a hospital, you find people from all walks of life. Is that right? Bill Gates, Donald Trump, amen, Barack Obama, they all one day will die. No matter how much money they have, no matter how much prestige they have, amen, they're all one day going to have to face this thing called death. And while we're talking about people in, in the world's eye of great esteem, let's talk about us. Just because we're so-called looked down on here doesn't mean that we're not going to face death too. But are we ready? That's the question. You see, it says in those days, because you have to understand what was going on in those days with Hezekiah. You see, sickness found Hezekiah in a time in which he was a man who walked true before God with a perfect heart. You ever hear sometimes at funerals and we say ourselves, you know, why did they have to go? And it seems like that sometimes that those who passes away that's close to us is the ones who who give everything to everybody. They always make an impact, and it's always them that go. Amen? Are we, are we getting this? Am I the only one? It seems like the troublemakers, they don't never go nowhere. People get on your nerve, they always around. They live a long life. Is that all right? But the ones that keep the family together, the, the glue of the family, those men, those are the ones who go. But we understand that sickness... Again, found Hezekiah at a time in which he walked before God with a true heart and a perfect heart. And it's also in the midst of the days where he was very useful to God. He had just uh, had a triumphant victory over the Assyrians. And we need to understand that, you know, you don't have to be finished with things in your life to, to go on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes we think that, well, God, you know, I got to do this. I got to accomplish this in my life. I got to get this stuff. And then I'll go. But God don't work like that. Amen. Think about this for a second. Since the day you and I were born, we've been dying. Is that right? Again, you don't have to be sick to die. But again, are we ready? I want to say this. For those who are truly fit to die, or to be fit to die, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I know that may not make, make sense, but let me say To really be fit to die, or those who are fit to die are really those who are most fit to live. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're fit to die, then you're the most qualified or you're the most fit to live. Is that all right? So in this situation with Hezekiah, he was actually walking before God with a perfect and upright heart. So he was, death shouldn't have been a problem for him. Is that all right? If, I, if I'm living a fit life, amen, then I'm fit to die. It's those of us who are not living a fit life who are not really ready to die. If I ask you right now, at this moment, at this very second, are you ready to die? And you have some concerns in your mind? That's a problem. Brother Rich prayed that we not set our house in order tomorrow, but today. You see, the only thing that God has promised you and I is this very moment. That's it. That's why we're encouraged in the book of James not to say what you're going to do tomorrow. I got this plan for tomorrow. If the Lord's will. Is that all right? Are we getting this? So watch this. 
if you're fit to live, then you're fit to die. And I want to put some scripture on that because I know we're asking. Watch this. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, and it's speaking about uh, widows. And it's speaking about how the church is to take care of widows who are widows truly or indeed. And it speaks about uh, the qualifications. But it speaks about a, a widow uh, who is not a widow indeed, but she's a younger widow. And it's saying, don't put this widow in your number because she still has some desires. And she's still wanting to be married. But it also talks about her and how if she is a busybody, what she's really doing in her life. Watch what it says. First Timothy 5 verse 6 says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You see, we have to understand that eternal life doesn't start over there. Eternal life truly starts right now. How you live right now will determine where you are then. That's why in John chapter 11, in the verses 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die you see death isn't so bad when you have a right relationship with Christ is that alright sometimes you know I, I, as I've officiated and served in, in funerals and things like that it is great to serve in a, in a situation where you know someone has has lived in Christ and is right with Christ because you can rejoice in that situation. Is that all right? I know, I know I'm not naive to the fact that we're going to miss them and, and things like that, but when you really know the scriptures, how we're going to be re re reunited in heaven and sing and praise God forever, death doesn't concern you all like that anymore. Is that all right? Y'all hear what I'm saying? But watch this. We have to recognize the fact that our being ready for death will not make it come any sooner. Just as our not being ready will not del delay its coming. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So when we talk about death, where's the comfort in death? We're speaking about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was told uh, by Isaiah that set your house in order. For you shall not you shall die and not live. Is that right? So how did getting that message? Where did Hezekiah find some comfort? We have to look at verses two and three. Verse two. The word of God says, then Hezekiah. Turned his face toward the wall. Is that all right? And you have to understand the, the meaning of this. He he turned because when they prayed, they had to pray toward the temple. So he turned toward the wall and he prayed unto the Lord. And watch this. Verse three says, and said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech or beg you how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. I have done that which is good in your sight and Hezekiah wept sore. The point I'm trying to make is the only thing when he was facing death straight in the face, the only thing that Hezekiah could call on is his relationship with the Lord. He said, I walked before you. I've done good. I've had a perfect heart. Is that all right? And we have to understand that even when we do this, it's not of our own selves. It's just by the grace of God. So I want you to understand that Hezekiah is not boasting about his own works. Amen. Are we getting this? You see, the point of the matter is this. We can humbly plead 
amen with the Lord as an evidence of our faith, our life, and our walk. Does that make sense to you? Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, what we, what we only, the only thing that we can hold on, amen, is how we had faith, trust, and total reliance on Christ Jesus, who is our righteousness. But if I don't have that to hold on to, how can I get any comfort? What can truly comfort me when I'm face to face with death? Amen. And I have no evidence that I have followed God, that, that I have lived a life pleasing in his sight. I have no real intimate relationship with him. What can be my comfort when I'm facing death? In that situation, death is a terrible thing. Watch this. When all is said and done, no one, y'all hear me? No one can stand alone before God. Watch this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one. You know, I watch this show. I say, you always watching shows. I watch a show on A&E called The First 48. Amen. Some of you may know it. They have a contract with the city of Cleveland. Amen. That's a shame. But I, I see a lot when these, they have these guys on camera, got them red-handed. And when they let them know what they know, somewhat, the first thing some of them say is, I want my lawyer. Because in that type of predicament, you need someone to defend you. Is that all right? Because you know you're guilty. They know you're guilty. And I'm not saying that for all the cases. So Y'all don't think I'm partial or nothing like that. But I'm saying for the ones they got caught red-handed on camera, they're guilty. And they need someone to defend them. And I'm here to tell you that when we go before God on Judgment Day, amen, all of us stand condemned. We're guilty. And if you don't have the best lawyer that ever was, the best advocate that there is, you're in trouble. If Jesus is not pleading your case, y'all hear what I'm saying? You can go get Johnny Cochran all you want to. Johnny Cochran is going to need some help on that day. Are we getting this? First Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 30. And this is going back to the fact of what can we really rely on when we face death in the face? The Bible says, verse 30, but of him. Is that what your Bible says? But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, speaking about Jesus, Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So what Hezekiah was doing, he wasn't boasting about himself. He was boasting in the Lord. He's saying, Lord, I got, I got evidence that I've, I follow what you say. Amen. And we know that God cannot lie. He keeps his word. Amen. Is that all right? Watch this. Only in him, the Bible says, do we live, move, and have our being. Therefore, when it comes down to it, we ought to be living our lives 
as though our life depends on it because it does. And I'm not talking about this life because this life is just for the vapor, the Bible says. But hear what I said again. You ought to be living your life right now as if your life depends on it because it does. Is that all right? And I know some will say, well, what's why so much emphasis on the way we live? And I know that that's a popular doctrine out there that. You know, grace covers everything. It don't matter how you live. God will care, care, take care of it all. Live the way you want to. That's been the devil's lie since the garden. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about uh, the propaganda that the enemy uses in all these different uh, taboo situations that we have in our society and things like that. The devil has been lying. Amen. Since the garden. He's a liar. And the Bible says he's the father of it. Is that all right? I don't know about you, but I'm just going to trust in God. Amen. Amen. So when we talked about, you know, why so much emphasis on the way we live, understand that the emphasis depends on the standard in which one lives unto. In other words, if you say, well, you know, I don't I don't believe that that matters. Who told you that? You always have people who have certain beliefs certain opinions and things like that. Well, I don't agree with you. Uh, you know, you guys are narrow minded. You guys aren't loving. You're not. Who told them that? Who? What's the standard of their belief? Because the truth of the matter is the only standard that's going to matter when it's all said and done is God's word. And we can stop a whole lot of headaches, a whole bunch of stress and anger and animosity. If when we deal with people, we just deal with them in a way that says, do you believe the Bible? And if they don't believe the Bible, then we don't have nothing to talk about. I don't care if it's mama, daddy, brother, sister, husband, wife. We used to be asked a question by William. Can you do more than God? Y'all hear that? Can you do more than God? Some of us sometimes want to make someone change. You know that's not possible because you can't even make yourself change. Been struggling with you for 30, 40 years. Amen. Is that all right? You see, it doesn't matter what man says. The Bible says in Romans 4, 3, what says the scriptures? What has God said about it? Is that all right? So when it comes to death... We ask the question, what has God said about it? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And y'all understand, I, I'm, I'm aware that death is not always an easy topic to speak about, but it's necessary. Is that all right? I don't mean to go back. Amen, Merv. But I can remember being six years old with my two older brothers in the bedroom with my mother. And we would have Bible study every week. But this one particular Bible study was different because she asked us a question at the end. She asked us, being little boys, 6, 10, and 14, she asked us, what are y'all going to do when I die? And I'm thinking to myself as a six-year-old, why would you ask a boy? We don't, we don't think about you dying. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But six months later, Merv, amen, that happened. Getting up to go to school. Amen. Why mom didn't wake us up this morning? Going to the bedroom, mom is dead. And you got three boys trying to figure out what just happened to mom. But the thing is, you have to understand that death is still coming for us all. And that was a traumatic experience 
But I thank God for it because it taught me that life is precious. And for all you young people in here who dogging out your parents, not appreciating what they're doing in your life, keep on living. Because one day they ain't going to be here to take care of you. We come in thinking that our parents are just going to be there forever. Don't appreciate them. Hey, Amen. I remember our mom telling y'all trifling. Y'all remember that? That word trifling? And we was. We was trifling. But the, the old saying is true. You never really appreciate what you have until it's gone. Sometimes as children, as young people, we think of everything that our parents don't do. You know? And we're speaking from experience of having lost mom and dad. And now, we're at an age where we're dads. Amen. Y'all say you don't have a daughter or a son. Yes, I do. Take care of Sydney. Take care of like she my own. I'm not trying to boast. I'm just telling you. Amen. But the thing is, you know, we can criticize and things like that. But when it's your turn, you see, we can be critical. Well, I don't think you should have raised me like that. I don't, you know, wait till you get kids. I ain't got no freedom. Such and such, they can go wherever they want to, and you'll see how they turn out. They, they go over this house, that house, yep. And that ain't love. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Don't let any and everybody take care of your children. I've seen some horror stories. Not from neighbors, from family. Cousins and uncles and all kind of mess. Is that all right? I don't know how I got over here. But the Lord wanted us to get there. I'm saying appreciate who you have. Appreciate what you have. Because whatever you have, you don't even have to have that. He says in Hebrews 9, 27, I didn't forget, I'm sorry. And as it is appointed, did y'all hear that? And as it is appointed, death couldn't come unless God appointed it. And you know, when God appoints something, it is an appointment. Is that all right? And as it is appointed unto men once to die. Watch this, y'all. And after this, the judgment. I don't mean to offend right now, but I'm telling you the truth. If I die right now, Maurice Merv should not say Mark is in heaven. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. I want you to turn with me to Luke 16. Let's hear what God has to say about once we die, after this, the judgment. I try to make it a point when I, when I facilitate funerals to, to make people understand, I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. Is that all right? I can't preach you in the hell, I can't preach you in the heaven because that's not mine to give. That's God's. Is that all right? Luke chapter 16. We all off course, but that's all right. Luke chapter 16, start with verse 19. Are you there? Start with verse 19. The Bible says, and the, the, the mistake about this, in the religious world, many preachers or whatever they call, they, they try to say that this is a parable. It's not a parable. A parable is not specific as to people's names, situations, and times. But watch what it says here. Let's read this real quick. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. 
And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. You say, what is this talking about? Understand that this man was so in torment and so in pain, he laid at the gate of this rich man. But the only relief he got was from dogs who came to lick his wounds. Is that all right? You see, when people won't do right by you, don't worry about it. God will still do right by you. Amen. Is that all right? Verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 22. And it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Watch this. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried. You see the difference? Beggar died, Lazarus. He was carried to the bosom of Abraham. We're going to find out right now where, where is the bosom of Abraham? This evening, I pray you come back at four because we're going to deal with Revelation chapter 20. We're going to deal with Judgment Day. And I pray we can be Judgment Day honest. Because at that day, it'd be too late to come clean. He says, again, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Watch this, y'all. And in hell. Is that what your Bible says? Now you have to understand the English word doesn't do the Greek that this was written in justice because there's different words for the word hell. The hell that's being talked about right here is Hades. Hades. The realm of the dead. That's where all the dead souls go. Amen. And in that realm of the dead... There's two regions. It would be like this sanctuary. You see the middle aisle right here? In the realm of the dead, you have two regions. This region, let's take it for example, this region is paradise. The bosom of Abraham. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to do y'all a favor this morning. Amen. <laughs> Enjoy it now. Is that all right? The bosom of Abraham. Notice, Abraham is in this realm. As great as Abraham was, Abraham, who is the father of Jews, the Judaism religion, Abraham, who is the father of Islam, the Muslim religion, Abraham, who is the father of Christianity, the Christian religion. But where we all go wrong is that when it comes to the promised seed, Muslims believe Ishmael was the promised seed. But the promised seed was Isaac. Even to a point where God told Abraham, go get your son, your only son. Because the son I told you to have is the one with your wife. Not when your wife told you to go have that handmaiden. Hey God, is that all right? And look at the world today and how we're suffering because of Abraham having listened to his wife. And notice he didn't fight his wife. Amen, brothers. Go sleep with my hand. All right. Okay, if you say so. You sure? And over there today, you have two brothers fighting. Have Isaac, the nation of Israel, and they're surrounded by their brothers, Ishmael. Ishmael's descendants, they hate Isaac. But you see, because of Isaac being the promised seed, no matter what Ishmael's descendants do, they'll never overtake Isaac. 
And I truly believe, I know I'm getting off the subject, y'all just bear with me. I truly believe that we're blessed in America because we are Christians and we help to take care of Israel. God has promised that nothing would ever happen to Israel. But again, this is paradise. Amen. I'm moving on. Let me turn this timer off because I know it's about to beep in a second. You remember when Jesus was talking to the man on the cross? And he said, remember me, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom? And he said, what? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see, even Jesus had to go to Hades. And on this side, Lord, have mercy. We have Tartarus, place of torments. Because the Bible says again, and in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Is that all right? Then it says, and see it. Notice, I want you to understand, even when you go down there, you are aware of everything. This is the book. He says, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, watch this, and Lazarus in his bosom. He couldn't notice him at all when he was at his gate. But now all of a sudden, hey Lazarus, is that all right? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus. The guy I didn't want to help at all. I wouldn't even give him no crumbs. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I'm tormented in this flame. Is that all right? But Abraham said, son, remember that thou in your lifetime received good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. In other words, what are you living for right now? If you're just living for the here and now, understand you got some, some pain to do later. Is that all right? He said, and beside this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, 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 so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Is that what your Bible says? So he realizes that there's no going back, that there's no second chance. So watch what he says, and this is what a good person would do anyway. Verse 27 says, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is the same Lazarus again that he wanted to cool his tongue. Now he's asking, can you send Lazarus to my family? Is that right? For I have five brethren that, may, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So where is this taken from? This was during the time of Moses when they still had opportunity to hear the word. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't hear the word on this side, then you won't be able to, to, to come back on the other side. Hear it now. Obey it now because it's not promised for tomorrow. Is that all right? Is that what he said? He says, and he said unto him, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though, ro though one rose from the dead. I want you to understand, because I'm about to close. Understand that this man, he has a life that many of us can relate to. He fared sumptuously in this life. He lived it up. Is that all right? But there's one peculiar thing in this story that we may not always see. 
this guy wasn't just an evil and bad guy. This guy knew the truth. Because the Bible says, again, when he lifted up his eyes, later on he said, Father Abraham. This man was a Jew. So there was Jews on the side of torment. Just as there will be Christians on the side of torment. I'm trying to make sure that it just ain't me. Because if it is, you and I will have eternity to think about what we had on this side. And somehow, some way, we just didn't do it. Somebody asked the question, how long is eternity? I just say it like this, too long to even try to consider how long that is. I'm going to stop right here because I think the greatest thing that we do outside of our, our, our five articles of worship is the invitation that's extended to all men to come and obey the gospel before it's everlasting too late. And right now, all of us right now have this opportunity for those here who have not obeyed the gospel, you have the opportunity right now to come and give your life to the Lord. And, you know, we were talking yesterday. You know, God's plan is so simple. It's too simple sometimes for people. Have to hear the word. So you hear the word of God, hear the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ do you believe that? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Are you willing to repent of your sins, to turn from the life you now lead to a life that God would be pleased with and understand he's the only one who can help you live that type of life in the first place? Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Understand then we have to confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. The eunuch on his way with Philip said, look, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Is that right? And Philip said, you may, if thou believest with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So we have to confess him because guess what? When Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Jesus, I ask you now. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus said, I am. And they killed him for it. They thought he was blaspheming, but he was telling them the truth. Can you imagine those men convicted God? But guess what? Our sins was up there too. And that's a humbling thought when you think to yourself, my sins made him have to go to that cross. Amen. And lastly, after you confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God, by faith and obedience, we do what he said. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. This is Jesus' words. Amen. If you need prayer, we'll pray with you. There are some situations in our lives that are so crucial right now in our lives that are so serious, it might as well be death. And the only one that I know that can raise the dead is God. So you may have situations in your life that you consider as dead, but God is able to resurrect it. The question is, do you trust in him? Do you have the faith to ask him who is able to do above everything that we ask or even think?